two, one, and we are live. And welcome to the Standout CEO Show, which is your gateway to standing out in a crowded market with your personal brand. And today, today's topic is all about the new, and I mean really new, rules of marketing. And honestly, one of the things that I absolutely love about the kind of work I do is that things are always changing and there's always something to learn, particularly in what I'm really focused on in video marketing. It seems like every single week, there's something for me to go explore that's new to discover and try to keep up with. And that spreads out all across the landscape of anything to do with whatever business you're in and whatever kind of way that you want to market yourself and your services and your products. So it's shifting sands, it's moving all the time. And in order to keep up with this, in order to sort of keep our things in, it's one thing to you know, try and do it all and try and learn it all. And it's another thing to filter out all the shiny objects that actually aren't good for us and the things that aren't working anymore. So you need to know stuff that's new, that's actually useful, and at the same time, what is the junk out there that I want to avoid? <laughs> so to help figure this out and navigate these charted waters, I've brought David Meerman Scott onto the show today, and he has just republished his book, The New Rules of Marketing. And we're talking, it's like new, 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 because <laughs> it's the eighth edition. <laughs> this is the eighth edition. This is a book that was originally published some 15 years ago, and this is the eighth time it's been republished, and he has added new chapters and new information and what is current for today, particularly in the post-pandemic or the last two years of social distancing that we've been dealing with, which has made many of us have to pivot and really completely change the way that we are operating and the way that we are looking at ourselves in relationship to our audience. So stay tuned. This is gonna be a really good one and I can't wait to get started. So let's do it. All right, David, welcome to the show. Hey, Brad, so good to be here. You're a rock star, man. I love I love the way you <laughs> pop up on your screen like that. <laughs> right, well, that's the idea. That's my idea. As I was saying before we got on, my, one of my ambitions is to be on the cover of Rolling Stone. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I had an ambition of, um, uh, of, of being in, on the cover of Rolling Stone too. Never made that, but I did end up with a listing in the Oxford English Dictionary, a word oh called newsjacking. Yeah, I know, right? How, how could you imagine that? A, a, a word called newsjacking that I invented, the idea of, and we can talk about this bit later if you want, is the idea of, of when you understand the news cycle, you create real-time content that could be a real-time video you push out right now or real-time blog post to tweet with a hashtag and so on to get noticed by the media and potential customers. And it became so popular. It was actually, I think I first wrote about it in the third edition of the New Rules of Marketing and PR. It's now become so popular that um, the Oxford English Dictionary put it in the dictionary. So, um, <laughs> so, that's, so that's super cool. And you're right, this is the eighth edition first edition I was writing in 2005 and 2006, and it released in mid-07. And when I was writing the first edition, Facebook was only for students. Twitter didn't exist. I mean, Snapchat, Snapchat and TikTok weren't even an idea yet. Um, so I constantly have to update the book with new tools, new stories, new ideas. And I also organize it in different ways, depending on what's important at that moment that the new edition comes out. Yeah, and just as a way to, to start it in this, this whole general topic, I mean, there's the new rules of marketing, but in your book, you also described the old rules. And you mentioned basically three, three this is like it breaks down into three parts. So can we just start yeah. right there and talk about sure. the old rules and what, what are we gonna leave behind? <laughs> 
Absolutely. So, and these rules have not changed in 15 years. It's always, I've always had these rules in the book. The, the, the old rules of marketing and PR were that you had three ways to generate attention. You could buy attention. You could buy attention by buying advertising. You know, you buy a billboard by the side of the road or magazine ads, radio ads, television ads. You could buy an email list. You could buy banner ads on websites. This was buying attention. Or you could reach out to the members of the media and say, please, please, please write or broadcast about my ideas. That's traditional kind of public relations. The other, the other way is that you could have an army of salespeople and um, if you're a B2B company, you could knock on doors, pick up the phone and cold call. If you're running a store, you could have an army of salespeople in there that, that descend on every customer that walks in the door. Now, if those are working for you, great. I'm not suggesting that advertising never works, but those older ways of generating attention don't work so well from the people that I speak with all over the world all the time. So the new rules, are that you publish content like we're doing right now, publish content on the web, video, audio, um, text-based content, infographics, photographs. I mean, these are all ways of generating attention using the new rules of marketing and PR. Right, yeah, okay. So the old rules are I either buy attention or I go begging. <laughs> Yeah. Or people to, to do it for me or to talk about me. Or I, or I bug people one at a time. It's right, right. buy, beg, and bug. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's great. All right. So in the new world, actually, before we, before we get into the, like, the new, new, new rules, I want to talk about the Grateful Dead. And part of the reason that's, is that I, got, do, I always want to talk about the Grateful Dead. Good idea. <laughs> Leslie saw in here and she goes, Grateful Dead. And she must have recognized your logo in the background. <laughs> Over my shoulder. That's so great. Hey, thanks for joining, Leslie. <laughs> so I did, in fact, first come across you when um, you published The Marketing Secrets of the Grateful Dead. And yeah. speaking of new rules versus old rules, the deads were very innovative for the time in terms of just completely moving into a new realm of how they marketed and promoted and actually built their fan base. And I want to sort of conjoin these two things because your work with that book and then later on with your book, Fanocracy, was really all about building relationship with your audience. So can you just speak to that? Yes. Yeah, of course. So, um, you know, I have been a lifelong fan. I first started hearing the Grateful Dead music. The neighbor next door to me when I was growing up, I was 12, 13, 14 years old, was playing Grateful Dead. We called them bootlegs at the time. But it turns out the Grateful Dead allowed fans to record concerts. How radical is that? Every other band said no. The Grateful Dead Here's the logo over my shoulder, said, sure, why not? If you want to record um, the music, that's fine. And you could even bring professional level recording gear. They gave you a, um, a place that you could plug in. They, uh, a little bit later, they gave you seat. You could get seats right behind the mixing board. Great spot for uh, the sound. And those initially cassette tapes later on MP3 files circulated and people shared them. The band said, as long as you share them or give them away, it's cool. We just don't want you to sell them. And that's how I first heard The Grateful Dead. And I said, wow, this is great. I want to maybe go to a show myself. And I went to my first show on January 17th, 1979 in New Haven, Connecticut. <laughs> um, and uh, <laughs> you got to everyone knows their first show, right? And um, and it was actually um, one of the very last shows of Donna and Keith. Um, and so I've seen them or the bands that followed after Jerry Garcia's death, like Further and Dead and Company and so on. I've seen them 86 times. I've probably spent um, tens of thousands of dollars over the years on the, on the Grateful Dead, either buying tickets or merchandise or whatever, all because I heard them in this, this context of the music that they allowed fans to record. And, and very few other bands did that. No, and none in the early days. And now some jam bands um, have adopted that same model. But, but when you think about it 
in today's world for all of us, there's so many organizations that don't do that. They do the opposite. What do they do? They create some content, maybe an ebook or a white paper or something, but then put it behind a firewall and say, the, oh, this is, not, this is free, totally free is what they say, but it's not because you have to fill out a form in order to get it. You have to put your name and your email address and how many kids you have and what your annual income is. And I'm exaggerating a little bit, but you have to register to get that so-called free content. That's not free. That's coercion. That's like when you, that's like if you were to go up to somebody in a, um, in a restaurant and say, oh, I think you're cute. Give me your business card. Um, I mean, that doesn't work. <laughs> um, so we outlined some of those ideas in our book, Marketing Lessons from the Grateful Dead, which I co-wrote with HubSpot co-founder Brian Halligan and Bill Walton, the NBA Basketball Hall of Famer, who, by the way, is the world's largest deadhead, not only because he's seven feet tall, but because he's seen the band 850 times. Oh my and God. I've, um, Bill, Bill's, a, Bill's a great guy. He's a buddy. I've gone to a bunch of shows with him. Fab fabulous <laughs> human being. He also now is in a band um, uh, that plays Grateful Dead music, which is super cool. Um, so yeah, um, Grateful Dead style marketing, it's, uh, it works. <laughs> you are, you're a fan, I'm a fan. Yeah, well, the thing that is most striking to me about what they did is that they really created an experience for the fans that were, was very unique and special and singular. So that, you know, the, one of the reasons that people, I mean, people would, you, I mean, that your experience of seeing so many concerts is not unusual among yeah. the Deadhead crew. You know, people would right. follow the band from city to city, from state to state, partly because they knew that, number one, each show was actually going to be different than the previous one. Right. They wouldn't just play their straight set lists every time. And then secondly there was this huge group of deadheads, like you got to be part right. of a tribe. And those two things combined, yeah. I think, you know, it continues, as you're saying, like, <laughs> to this very day, it's still it, 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 it continues. And it continues not only with the original members of the Grateful Dead, there's uh, four surviving members that still have bands and are out there playing. Um, but it also continues that there's um, at last count that I've seen, over 300 bands that play Grateful Dead music, and you could go to pretty much any city uh, in the in the United States, and there'll be a band. There's actually Grateful Dead Tribute Band dot com, which you can go check out, where you can look city by city. And I do that when I travel. When I travel for delivering speaking engagements, I'll take a look and see if there happens to be a band playing that night, and I'll try to show up if I usually if it's after my talk, not before my talk, and and be able to have you know experience a local Grateful Dead band in a in a in a city maybe I've never even been to before. So how cool is that? The music <laughs> I believe this music will live on for a very long time. Yeah, Leslie says she saw them in San Francisco for free many times at Golden Gate Park. Wow, <laughs> wow. cool. I've never what? seen them. Oh, I saw them free once. Yeah, free. I did see them free once in New York City. <laughs> All right. So now like moving into the more to sort of ordinary world that we all inhabit, you know, we're doing our stuff. We're marketing ourselves in a variety of ways. In the last couple of years, a lot of that has moved online. I mean, I would imagine yeah. for yourself as a thought leader and a speaker and an author who was at one time speaking at a lot of events as well as publishing a book and then wanting to do a book tour, which all of those things would have been in person. Like in the last couple of years, almost all of those opportunities were non-existent. And so all of that kind of right. activity right. has moved into the online sphere and the virtual world and so in this you know this is now we're getting into the the new things that can or can't work <laughs> so mm -hmm. how do you see now that you've i mean you've obviously been thinking about it the last couple of years because you've republished this new edition how do you see this new landscape given what's just happened to the entire world well it's so interesting to me is that um, you know, back in, two, back in 2020 and sort of March was when my line in the sand for the pandemic, 
Um, all of a sudden, you couldn't go on sales calls. You couldn't have client conferences. You couldn't go to retail stores. You couldn't have um, uh, uh, events, um, you know, uh, and meetings and so on. So the world changed, absolutely changed. And in particular, what I focused on in a big way was the rise of virtual events. And I did a lot of research and writing about the idea of virtual events. And what I noticed is that very early in mid 2020, many companies who had to cancel their in-person events, their, you know, their client conferences or the associations who had their big annual gatherings, what they tried to do was take an in-person event, what they've done over the last you know, decades and cram it into a Zoom room. But that didn't work because it's a different medium. Video is different. So what does work is thinking about it as more like a television show and thinking about episodes. And you know, when you think about a, a, a one hour television uh, news show, you know, like the Today Show or something, there's, um, they read the news from the desk, then they do a stand up segment where they're introducing some kind of product or service, they might go on um, out on site and have a recorded segment, there might be a musical guest, there's all sorts of different elements that come together, but it's fast paced. And the great events, virtual events ended up having more of a cinematic metaphor than a theatrical metaphor. And um, so I thought that was fascinating. And so many organizations got it wrong. And that's the same thing that happened, you know, 15 or 20 years ago when we moved from offline marketing only to offline and online marketing is people took their offline marketing and crammed it online and that didn't work. That's why banner ads just didn't really work that well. <laughs> and so and so all, all of us who are, needing to get the word out there need to be thinking, how is the medium that I'm using different from what I already know? And how can I adapt accordingly? Yeah, I really just want to underline that idea of turning things into a show. I think there's a yeah. lot that people who are looking at doing any kind of video, whether they're doing a webinar or whether they're doing a regular, you know, set of Facebook lives, or if they're doing a YouTube channel, you know, all of those kinds of things, or even doing TikTok, I suppose. Um, there's a lot of lessons to be learned from what podcasters are doing. Because yeah. every podcaster calls their podcast a show. <laughs> and it's done, you know, it, it's consistent, it comes out at the same time, at least if they're doing the right way, it's coming out the same time, same days every week. And whether it's an interview show or a solo thing, it's very much like this is an episode and, and they even the clever ones will actually create a series. They'll create a serial kind yeah. of experience right. so that, you know, I'm doing this today, but stay tuned because next week I'm going to do this other thing. And people will basically tend to become very loyal fans and listen and binge and share and so forth. And that's how they grow their audience. And it's interesting because... Yeah. In the podcast world, it's it's hard for a podcast to gain very much visibility because there isn't any search yes. engine optimization and there isn't any social media for podcasts, really. Um, so when you take all of those ideas and you cart them over to one of the other platforms in video format and you create a show experience for people, then you're getting you know all of those positive elements plus the fact that you're on a social platform, which can actually help you with yeah. your reach and visibility. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's really interesting, Brad. And I what I what I've found is that on one hand, we're going in that direction that you just described of kind of here's when our show comes out. But I also see and I talked about this very briefly at the top of the show. I also the, see the idea of the importance of real time instant engagement and following the news and doing news jacking and very, very few people do that in order to get noticed. So here's the difference. The difference if you're marketing a product or service or an idea or your or your business or whatever it is. Um, mo what m the vast majority of people do is they uh, create content and that's great. And then they put it out when they're ready. 
Here's my blog post. I'm ready to send it. You should look at it. Here's my video. I'm ready to publish it on uh, a YouTube or Vimeo or wherever I publish it or TikTok. And now you should take a look at it. Um, uh, and what I would suggest that we all experiment with, and I've been doing this now for 20 years. Um, I, my first job was on a bond trading desk. I understood real-time content. Then I worked in the real-time financial news business for companies like Dow Jones and Reuters. So I've understood real-time content since prior to the web. And um, what you do is you think, what's happening now that I can create content about? What's happening now that people might want to be interested in what I have to offer? So this turns it on its ear. Rather than saying, here's my stuff when I'm ready to send it, you say, here's something that's interesting because now is the moment everyone wants to have this content. And I'll give you a great example from a week ago. Uh, so over last weekend, as this is recording, it would have been um, in the, the very end of April, um, there was talk of Elon Musk potentially making a bid for Twitter, and it hadn't been announced during the weekend. When I woke up on Monday morning, then I was seeing news stories that said um, he hadn't, he has not, um, he's made an offer for Twitter, but Twitter has not formally accepted yet. But people were expecting that Twitter was going to formally accept. And I woke up that morning at four o'clock in the morning. I normally do that. I don't have on a really weird schedule because I go to bed <laughs> early. I wake up early. I exercise. My wife's Jap my, my wife is Japanese and she um, uh, writes and speaks like I do. She's written, uh, I don't know, 10, 10 or 15 books and um, also has a very, very big social media presence. And because of the time zone is completely swapped, we have a weird sleeping schedule. That's way more information than you need to know. <laughs> but what, you, what, what is interesting is I was up early and I wrote a blog post. And the title of the blog post was Attention Elon Musk. The right of free speech is not the same as the right of algorithm uh, amplification. And it drew on my, my um, uh, research over the last five years or so on the social media algorithms, which I think have drifted into the dangerous territory because they seed polarization. They push people into the red team versus the blue team here in this country. And uh, they breed conspiracy theories. And we, it's a long, long, longer discussion than we have for now. But I was able to write a full-blown blog post about social media amplification at the precise moment the whole world was waiting for Twitter to accept Elon Musk's <laughs> offer. And that blog post took off. It was amazing. I, I did an interview with TechCrunch um, about that idea. Uh, Seth Godin, the most popular marketing blogger in the world, um, put a link to my blog post in the, in the blog post he wrote that day. Um, and my blog post ended up with, I, I don't remember the exact number now, but something like 20,000 or 30,000 views and tons of shares. And the post had, I think, maybe 30 comments on it. And that's more than I normally get because I was putting out the content at the time people wanted to see it, which is extremely rare because what most people do is they put out their content when they're ready. Yeah. No, actually, I, I saw that blog post. I read it. Oh, there <laughs> you go. Thank probably you. Like <laughs> millions of others. <laughs> but I mean, it, Thank you. it's, you're so right. Like it was so timely. It was so of the moment. And not only that, but you're speaking about something that I think a lot of people know is out there, but but you're giving voice to it. And I think yes. that's what's super helpful. And then and you're opening up a conversation because you know, people will see that and then they want to respond to it. Like, and and when you get somebody like Seth Godin linking <laughs> to your post, it's like, ping, you win the game. <laughs> I know, right? It's, it's, it was amazing. And, and I think every single person who's listening to or watching this right now has similar kind of expertise. I don't, I don't know what that expertise is, but we all have something that we know a great deal about that eventually, it may not be tomorrow, it may not be next week, it may not even be next month, but eventually there will be a need for your expertise because there will be news 
breaking in your area of expertise that you can get out there when the moment is right. It might be a change in regulations. It might be um, the Supreme Court making a decision. It might be um, a particular news um, outlet writing a, a big um, ex, uh, expose piece on, on something that you understand deeply. That is your moment. Drop everything. If you're talking to Brad, say, I got to go, Brad. I've got to write a blog post right now. Um, if you're at the dinner table on a Sunday, you know, hey, love you, my family. Thank you for the dinner. I got to go. I got to write a blog post right now. I got to shoot a video right now. I've got to get uh, get some social media posts right out, right out there now. Because if you wait, t tomorrow's too late. A couple hours from now can be too late. Right. Yeah. Okay. So the formula is first... Get up at four in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't have to be four because if the news is, had broken at nine o'clock at night, I would have been snoring already. <laughs> right, right. Well, it's interesting because I see um, I see uh, people who are publishing news, you know, podcasts and news types of stories on a regular basis, but but their thing maybe only comes out twice a week, and they really struggle right. with what you're talking about because they miss many news cycles and they miss the moment. Yes. In fact, they, and they'll talk about it, how frustrated they are that, oh, it's Thursday and this thing happened mm. way back on Monday and this is so old news right. now. <laughs> so yeah, yeah timing. No, that's, that's true. So, so I, think, I think a solution is, can you have both? Can you do what you've just described um, eloquently, which is have a show, you know, put it out at a certain date and time every week and be prepared and have another channel that you can push out things when the moment is right. Yeah, yeah, good one. News jacking. Well, I'm going to write that down and start doing it. I love it. That's a good. terrific Excellent. strategy. It's a big light bulb for today's episode. Well, we are right at the close of our time together. So if there is like one rule that we didn't get to that you think is essential, it's like, oh, we didn't talk about this thing we really need to, it's too bad. That's the big miss. <laughs> what would that one thing? I, I would, uh, passion, passion. Um, I think marketing should be fun. Mar I'm talking about marketing and I'm also talking about my favorite band, The Grateful Dead. We didn't talk about surfing um, during the show, although you and I are both surfers, Brad. Um, when you share passion, you're, you come alive and uh, your passion is infectious and the idea that you should have fun doing marketing, you should have fun doing your public relations, get yourself out there, show your passions. People will, get a bit, will be attracted to you, though we will, will want to do business with you. Yeah, that's great. Well, I know that you walk your talk. I saw an image of you doing a zero gravity flight. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> it's like yeah. out yeah, there yeah, with yeah. your arms outstretched is like oh look at that that's so great well you can you can see a um a saturn model of a saturn V rocket over my shoulder oh, here that. and i wrote i wrote i uh, wrote a book called um marketing the moon about the apollo lunar program and i'm a huge fan of the apollo lunar program i actually have some a collection of artifacts from the the program and i've always wanted to go into space but i mean i can't afford those ridiculously priced tickets but what i was able to afford was going in the zero G um, flight with Charlie Duke, who is um, the lunar module pilot of Apollo 16. He walked on the moon. And how cool is it to, um, to join him down at Kennedy Space Center for a, for a flight and go zero G with, uh, with a moonwalker, it's super crazy. <laughs> That's so great. Well, that and then of, even... course, then, of, then, of course, I had to turn it into content for the web and social media posts. <laughs> right, there you go, right, that, which is where I saw it. All right. so. Anyway, thank you so much for doing this. If people want to get a hold of the book or they want to follow up with you, what are the best ways for them to do that? Uh, so one rule we didn't talk about is make sure people can find you. My name is <laughs> David Meerman Scott. Um, there are a whole bunch of David Scotts in the world. There's a David Scott who walked on the moon as the commander of Apollo 15. There's a David Scott who's a member of Congress from Georgia. There's a David Scott who's an Ironman triathlon champion. Um, so I realized 20 years ago I had to be unique and I started using my middle name, which is Meerman, M-E-E-R-M-A-N. So if you Google David Meerman Scott, you get me and only me. And that's actually a bit of a, of a, of a new rule is make sure you can be found on the web 
um, by your, your business name and or your personal name. Um, uh, on most of the social networks like Twitter, I am DM Scott, D-M-S-C-O-T-T. And the new rules of marketing and PR, the eighth edition is available um, at all different places, all different bookstores uh, in the US and Canada as we speak um, in early May and in the rest of the world soon, an audiobook version coming in a, in a month or two. Okay, well, I'll make sure that there are links to you in the show notes. And thank you. Thanks again for coming on today. This has been really fun. <laughs> My, my, and my, for me too, Brad, thank you. It's always great to be interviewed with someone with your enthusiasm as well as a surfer and a deadhead. That's a very <laughs> un, unique, unique and wonderful how combination. Many, how many of, can there be? <laughs> uh, there All aren't, right. believe, there, there's, there are some, I, I, uh, I do know some. Um, if you ever get out to Nantucket Island, go to Cisco Beach and the guy who runs the surf, surf school, Gary Koner is a buddy huge deadhead and a professional surfer. So there you go. All right. Cool. Awesome. Great. Well, thanks again. <laughs> and my pleasure for the folks who are here still listening at the very end. I just want to remind you that the entire archive of the standout CEO show is available at standoutceoshow.com. You can go there, you can watch videos, you can listen to the podcast episodes, you can binge them all to your heart's content. And if you got value from today's episode and you know someone who needs to learn a few of the new rules or who would be just perfect for doing some newsjacking, share this episode with them. That would be appreciated. And of course, the best way to join us is to join us live every Tuesday, every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern time. And until the next time, so long, everyone. We will see you again.